So uh, today we're going to talk about um, kind of some steps for success for uh, uh, Caribbean medical students and uh, some things that you can do to really help you, um, whether you're in the beginning, um, whether you're just getting started, whether you're, um, you're still you know, in the Caribbean, whether you're, even if you're um, maybe in a transition process uh, of doing rotations or in your third or fourth uh, year rotations as well. So uh, just to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Kendall Wyatt. I am an, uh, the content director here at Picmonic. Uh, so I manage all of our medical content. Uh, just a little bit about me, just really fast. Um, I was started out as a paramedic, went to nursing school. Uh, I'm an RN as well, and I'm in my fourth year of medical school. And I actually go to Avalon University, uh, which is in Curacao. Um, and I'm doing my finishing out my rotations here in the Phoenix Valley. And I've got about, um, uh, I think, about six months or so until I'm completely finished. So definitely kind of right in the midst of some where a lot of you um, you guys are right now. So what is Picmonic? Just a little bit about us, um, just so you know. Um, we are we take fun pictures and turn everything, um, all the medical facts that you need to know, into these stories so that you can remember it. So something like warfarin, the drug warfarin, becomes a war theory. And of course, when you learn the warfarin Picmonic, you can remember the monitor PTINR, you remember this. Um, contraindicated in pregnancy, and of course you can easily remember all those antidotes like vitamin K and fresh frozen plasma. Or in Picmonic land, um, the Viking King and the fresh frozen, frozen plasma screen TV. So uh, just a little bit more, um, we cover over a thousand topics for medical students, pretty much everything you need to know from day one, whether you're in an anatomy course or a basic course, or whether you moved on from physiology into the pathology, pharmacology, as well as all the things you need to know in your rotations. And the great thing is um, we are adding new topics every day into our database of facts. So enough about that. Let's actually just go ahead and get um, jumped right into what we're really going to go over. We're really going to talk about um, some hurdles of things of Caribbean students um, and really kind of what we've said that are some, some seven steps to success. Um, and a couple of those kind of break out into a couple other things. Some of this information you may know. Uh, maybe you're a more proactive student or you've had somebody who's been there. But one thing, especially from experience, is that you know you go to a, a Caribbean school and so many of these things aren't explained to you um, and you just kind of have to discover a lot of it yourself. So we're going to talk about um, a lot of those things that you need to know, really kind of some things really you really should kind of be aware about. Um, and well, some real realities that you're going to face um, as a, a Caribbean student. This webinar is not, of course, meant to offend anyone, uh, but uh, we're going to hit on some hard-hitting points that are obvious realities that you know students that are Caribbean from the Caribbean um, that aren't uh, uh, US, from a U.S. school that will definitely face. Of course, we're going to go just review everything we talked about, and then at the end, um, we'll do a brief Q&A so that you know um, you can have your information. So the first thing. Uh, really to jump right in is no matter where you're at, whether you're uh, just starting out or whether you are advanced, um, maybe you're in your third or fourth year, is to really think about what your final goal is. And of course, everyone's final goal is a residency. Um, and one thing that I see so many students, um, we work at Picmonic, we have over 130,000 students that write in, U.S. students, international students from all over the world. But um, one of the things is people don't really think about what is the um, long-term uh, ramifications, or not even ramifications, what, you know, the things that they need to think about. Um, and you really, really start about that by thinking about residency from day one. Um, and this is a little bit different than, a, than what a U.S. student would do. You start from the beginning, um, you really need to think about what kind of residency you want to do, but you also have to understand some real hurdles. Um, and that is, does the type of residency or the residencies that you take even accept international students or inter international medical gra graduates, or as we hear, um, uh, IMGs. And um, one thing that's really important is to know different program requirements ahead of time. And those program re requirements are all things that you can look up, and we're going to talk about those in a second. As well as knowing um, a lot of programs as residencies become more and more competitive require minimum step one scores, minimum step two scores, as well as a lot of them having a first pass requirement. And something we're going to talk about at the very end um, is having your ECFMG certification, um, whether you need to have at the time of application for certain programs um, to kind of give you your best foot forward. And if you're li listening to this, you think, well, um, I'm maybe your beginning student. You don't need to know this stuff. But I can tell you right now, this is one thing you need to know, especially as an international student from the beginning. Um, you've got to think about this stuff from day one so that you can really set yourself up for success. Because what I see so many students doing, students I'm rotating with right now, they didn't know this stuff ahead of time, and they're really scrambling uh, to get a lot of it done. And that's what I 
we're ho hopefully we're going to do today is just kind of bring you up to speed on a lot of different things that are out there. So one of the uh, first things, uh, the other second thing is to really be informed. Be informed yourself yourself about all of the information that's out there. Now we're going to use a lot of different. I'm going to talk about a different bunch of different links and websites that are out there. And uh, the important thing is that you we're going to send you these links in your email, whatever email you registered with, so you have all the links to visit all these particular sites. But unfortunately, um, as much as I actually am, you know, a, a part of it, just as everyone else involved today is, is that um, you need to understand uh, different USMLE step score trends, um, what those score trends are. And you can see here, this is actually um, uh, one of the documents that's published by the NRM. NRMP um, that's out there. And of course, we're going to send you the link to this as well, but it's their 2014 match statistics residency report. And it basically shows you here, here are all the, um, all the specialties for residencies, and here are all these scores that are out there. Now, if, if, especially if you're a beginning student, you can see independent applicants, and that includes everybody Caribbean, um, whether you're in a fifth pathway, anybody else are all groups down here. But what you can pretty much see is the scores almost follow the exact same trend line. So um, the you know the step one is definitely the best way or step two as well for you know the um, uh, programs to really woo you know kind of draw a line in the sand uh, whether you're an international student or or a U.S. student or whatnot and what uh, at least what I've learned is um, you know your score is really important but students don't really think about or they're not um, basically as uh, well informed as they should or they're going to have one of these other weaknesses that we're going to follow. Um, here in a second to really give you your best, um, your best, um, uh, best foot forward. Uh, the next thing, um, if you looked at, you know, you saw that particular report, you saw, wow, you know, dermatology is this crazy score. Um, you know, you maybe you want to look up dermatology programs and find out how many there are. Um, there's online. You can go on to. Um, I'm actually not sure how to really pronounce this, um, but I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. But Frida, um, which is um, the actual database of all of the programs, you can go in and find all the programs in there and kind of how many spots they have, how many unmatched spots, things like that that you can use to kind of find programs. Now, once you find those programs, um, you can you know copy down their information, but you can reach out to them. Um, they get all the time. You can look at their website right away and find out. Okay look at their website, find out their minimum requirements. Now you can keep track of this yourself as you're going along. Maybe you're, you're in your beginning part of school and you, and you just started and you think, well, this is too much stuff to think about in the beginning. But I'm telling you, it's also going to be a great motivator to keep you studying that you're going to have to realize really quick that a lot of these programs are very competitive. So they're making you, um, they have a lot of pretty high minimum scores on some of them and it also may realign some of your goals to be more realistic depending on where you are. We're going to talk about that in a second. There's also some third-party services. Um, third-party services like um, electronic residencies out there, and the other one I can't remember the name of. But they're actually databases that you can go in and, um, and keep track of, uh, or they, their databases, rather, that keep track of um, whether they have cer certain programs have a minimum score or certain programs allow or even accept uh, international students. And um, sometimes I, you know, I've actually... Uh, seen several of these databases. Some of them are pretty good. It's definitely a good um, good outline. But the best thing, of course, the number one thing, is to look on their website. You're going to find that information right there. And of course, you can reach out to them via phone or email. Just make sure that, as always, you're not bombarding them. Because no matter from day one, you are a potential applicant. And you should kind of think of yourself as applying to this uh, program. The next thing um, that I think is one of the most important, and we're going to come kind of come back to this as well in the end, um, and circle back around, but it's really um, identifying your weaknesses. Uh, and especially with Caribbean students, everybody has a different reason or, or whatnot, uh, whatever it is, why you are at a Caribbean school. Um, now, some things that are really important, these are really the three areas that you can identify from the beginning and be aware of uh, things that you have in a weakness uh, moving forward. One of the biggest ones, and the one that can be fixed right, uh, pretty much, you know, you can easily assess. Is you can personally assess and look at your interpersonal skills. So, are you somebody who's able to just jump out there and talk to people, introduce yourself, and um, interact with them, as well as speaking Eng the English language fluently and understanding questions and things that, um, you know, with the, to be able to converse and have a normal conversation, a fluent conversation, something that somebody is not going to have trouble interpreting what you're saying. And that's really kind of a, a touchy area that I um, 
a lot of students get offended. They're like, oh, well, I speak English. Now, what's important is so many students have reached out to us afterwards, and they said, you know, Kindle, Pygmonic, you were right. Um, it's definitely, I could have got a lot better score if I made sure that at the core part, I really was understanding um, English and understanding and having good interpersonal skills, which is even more important as you go into your rotations, because you need to interact with patients and really feel comfortable interacting and have those good social skills. Seems crazy, um, and a lot of, uh, at least like myself, um, a U.S. resident who went to the Caribbean and came back, not such a problem for me, but as you um, realize, it definitely is something you may, may need to be aware of and definitely address. You can also look at your resume and look at your resume and see what other types of things are you know, on your resume that may be a strength or a weakness or where you can improve. You know, definitely trying to get into some type of research or other things, um, just other things to really help your resume and make it a nice strong resume to, um, to a potential uh, residency program. And that really starts in the beginning because you're not going to have any extra time to get that stuff done later. And of course weaknesses are of course learning the medical content, the biggest bulk one, because you need to get a you know you need to get a particular type of score, a level score to get um, to keep moving through the particular process. Um, and that that's really kind of leads us into um, the really the most important thing, um, number four, especially if you're still a student and and um, a lot of the Caribbean programs have a um, a 16 month uh, you know course. Uh, that kind of goes through, and that's a lot of information. Trust me, I know. To get all the same information, kind of cram packed in here into this very short amount of time. Um, but what's really, really important, if it today, um, no matter where you're at, whether you're in your uh, first semester, your fourth semester, um, you need to pick a plan and pick a test date. So you pick this date that you want to take USMLE Step One, or if you're in your rotations, pick a date that you want to take USMLE Step Two. And then think backwards from that test date and say, okay, so I want to um, finish my, uh, my MS1 and MS2, med school year one and two courses, my, basically my core basic sciences, and I want to take my USMLE three months, four months, five months, one year, whatever that date is, pick a date and pick a solid date where you think you are. Be honest with yourself. Not everyone's going to be able to take it right away, um, especially after going through a rapid 16 months. And what you're going to do is work backwards. So work backwards to really kind of create yourself a schedule um, that t tells you, okay, I need to study, uh, you know, histology, um, anatomy. I need to break these topics down into this particular area. Or if you're reviewing for for, um, for step one, you can break down based on like first aid or whatever book, or step two if you're following uh, master the boards or whatever book you may be using. You break it down as well. And with that, you also practice questions. Um, you practice your questions because that really is the number one thing. A test bank like U World of Kaplan, which we're going to talk about in a second, make sure you're testing yourself and make sure you test yourself realistically. Um, I um, see, we're going to talk about this in a second, um, I see a lot of mistakes um, with realistic testing that students aren't doing. Because this brings us to our next, um, our next statement. And again, a kind of another touchy one that some students get kind of get offended on. Now, your school exam scores are biased. Why are they biased? Well, it's a school exam score. Um, and you're working really hard to get this school exam score. Now, um, sometimes, depending on what school you're at, I know some of the schools may not have a professor that maybe didn't, didn't take the USMLE. Maybe they're not from the US. Maybe they're a PhD. Maybe they're not exactly teaching you um, the most targeted material for like a step one or step two um, approach. Well, what do you do? Of course, there's always a solution. Number one is follow um, definitely resources that you know you can follow along with. Uh, let things like Pathoma and whatnot are great resources to really study long term to um, to make sure you're learning the right content. Um, but most importantly is to honestly self-assess. Now, for M uh, for your first and second year, you can do these self-assessments um, through MBME. Uh, the National Board of Medical Examiners, MBME, another link we're going to send you, the MBME self-assessments. So you can do this. Um, there are lots of different forms. Uh, break those forms down and put them into your study pro process. If you're going to take step one six months from today, and there are seven forms, I believe, of MBME for step one right now, you could maybe do one per month. And be honest. Take those in. Don't do the self-paced uh, version where you can take it over four hours. Because I tell you what, you need to condition yourself and be honest. Where am I at today? And that involves taking a four-hour exam in, uh, in the exact amount of blocks, just like 
um, you're going to have when you take USMLE Step 1. Start conditioning yourself to sit down for four hours and take a four-hour block of tests because you need to be able to take Step 1 at seven-hour blocks. And it's definitely something that you need to force yourself to answer the questions in that small amount of time. Um, and that's definitely the best way. When you get those exam those versions done, you know, review the answers you got wrong and really kind of understand uh, where your weaknesses are and then gauge where you're going to be. You can see estimated scores from your USMLE Step 1. So we go back to where we were with the residency plan, right? So you went back and you said, okay, I need to get a 240, 230, 220, 210, just passing, whatever it is. The MBME self-assessments are the most reliable resource out there to give you an accurate score. And of course, only if you do it in the exam mode where you actually take it like a real exam. So you take it, you get up for five minutes after a block, you sit back down, you start again. Don't take the four-hour one. That's definitely, you're, you're just cheating yourself. Of course, um, during your third and fourth year, if you're studying, um, you know, if you're third or fourth year, definitely you can do the M MBME subject exams um, and... Um, as far as you can do one per rotations, uh, they don't have they have everything except for family as far as your cores. There's an internal med, there's a surgery, there's an OB, as well as a peds for all those core examinations. You can take each one of those and um, really kind of see if your school makes you do MBME examinations. If they don't make you do these examinations, this is what you will use as your um, uh, your predictor. It is what you can use. Use it like a real exam and use it for your benefit. Um, don't um, just be honest with yourself. If you're not ready to take it, don't take it. Because guess what? Everybody knows you take USMLE Step 1 and you get a 195. You barely, you know, you just pass. You can't retake it again. You're stuck with that 195 forever. Um, and number one, another thing that's really important, um, as we went back to our first slide, um, there are so many more programs that do not accept uh, if you failed any examination once. That's one of their weeding out criteria. Um, they, you know, they're less likely to weed you out because um, let's say you took an extra five months, an extra six months to study to get a great score, um, then um, uh, they don't really weed you out because of that. That's not a weeding out criteria that's in the computer system, but definitely weeding you out at a 200, anybody below 200, 210, 220, 230 for some of those dermatology and plastic surgery type um, residency programs, those are definitely things that just cut the application process in, in half. So um, the other thing, um, that's important right along with this is really to be your own advocate. Um, so many of the Caribbean students write into us and they ask a lot of questions um, that really seem common sense. Um, and I guess to me they're common sense because I had to figure them out at my at one point and or another. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the school is able to help me out per se. Um, I think I'm fortunate my school helps me out with a lot of things if I ask. Um, but a lot of these things that other schools maybe push down your throat um, to make sure that you've done the MBME, maybe requiring you to take an MBME, because that's that's a wake-up call, especially if you have to take the MBMEs um, at a testing center. So you take these MBMEs at the testing center, you're stuck in that testing environment, and you're right in that step one or step two mode to, to move forward. Um, and the next thing, um, along with this, which is probably one of the things that... Uh, is really kind of um, kind of a sad one. Is really make sure that you're using relevant content and excellent resources. Uh, you need to make sure you're using trusted resources, resources that are proven from other students to work for USMLE Step One or Step Two, or depending on what you're using. And what I mean by resources, as far as the question banks you're using, uh, make sure you're using the re the relevant ones. I think that honestly, the staple out there is, of course, you know, USMLE World and and um, to, and, you know, right behind that Kaplan, making sure you're understanding things. And of course, um, Picmonic is a good resource. Now, here's an interesting thing. I see all, I actually see it all the time, and uh, it's definitely something that is a, a real pet peeve and really a sad thing. Um, so many students uh, pirate a lot of uh, train, you know, videos, um, review courses per se, and they try to use review courses during their their actual uh, basic science studying. Um, it, first off, if you're using an old version, let me tell you what these resources continually do. Well, they update their content. And every single year, just like Picmonic does, we listen to our users. Thousands and thousands of users write into us all the time telling us what we should do better, how we should give better, more direct information for their particular exam or for their particular course. And that's exactly what we do. And what you realize is all the time, just like Picmonic, these other resources are updating their content. And that's super important if you're using an old version that may have been pirated from somewhere. You're only going to get one shot at this. It's definitely a 
great idea to use the most up-to-date. I always hear this, well, I don't have the money. Well, I know you may not have the money, but let's look at, look at this in the grand scheme of things. If you could get an extra five or ten points because you used the most up-to-date resource, which had additional things in, in, the, um, in the version, those are very, very valuable. You're cutting out hundreds of other applicants based on where you are in that scale. That's one of the best things that, that um, residency programs use is just to hack out and get rid of so many applications. Some of these residency programs get thousands of applications that come in, and they definitely just instantly have to weed you out by score. And if you make that, then you can come in second with all of your other resources that you have. So make sure that they're up to date, as well as using up to date, which is definitely something uh, from uh, Wartress Kluver Klein that we um, uh, we definitely recommend, and I I use actually every day in practice. In my rotations, excuse me, definitely a great resource as well. Your school may or may not give you access to that, but that's another another great resource that you can purchase on your own to constantly look things up as you don't understand. What are we actually teaching today with the right algorithm on what to do first, second, third, fourth? Um, that's at least one of my personal weaknesses is finding those algorithms and where do we do first, second, third, fourth? And we actually use, I use up to date uh, to actually um, to go through and review those information to give us the best uh, resource possible. So along with the same time of being your own advocate, of course, and this is uh, maybe the most one that people roll their eyes, but it's don't procrastinate. Here's what's going to happen, especially as you are a um, um, uh, student, you know, you're going through, especially if you're doing a 16-month straight-through course, you're going to skip over something. You're going to be like, well, I'm going to learn that later, or I'll just remember that when I do my step one study. And you're doing yourself a huge disservice when you do that. Make sure you learn those basic core concepts. There's really how those things work. Because let me tell you, even on as I'm doing, um, you know, higher level stuff, all of those key points, those key little tidbits, are what come back in to give you those extra points and that clue on what the answer is later on, whether it's in step two or later, of course. And they keep, you know, everything is intertwined, and they really want you to um, really understand that. What I also find is as you're learning other content, let's say you skipped over histology. Personally, I hate histology. You skipped over a lot of histo stuff. Well, if you didn't learn that, you're not able to really gather and understand that stuff when you're learning the pathophysiology or you're getting those other images as well. So you're definitely doing yourself a disservice. So don't, don't skip ahead with that as well. So um, the, the next thing, um, and this is one for your entire course, especially as a, um, an international student, it's very easy to get sidelined. Um, some of the schools, actually most of the schools that I, uh, and the students from schools that I have worked with, they don't have a very solid regimen. They kind of give you a way to kind of find your own place because everybody find kind of has their own um, speed at which they master everything. So this is really important where we say pick that date in the beginning, pick that date and stick to it because then you're going to be able to stay organized and create a rhythm and follow that pace. Whether you're doing a number of questions per day, number of pages in a book per day, but whatever that is, stick to it and, you know, Make sure you're conforming to your own um, your own um, process. That way, when you get to your goal, you should have covered all the material, and you should be also uh, able to do it. If you miss, let's say you miss two weeks, you, it's okay. You missed two weeks, but that add would have to add two weeks, or you need to make up the difference of what you actually missed. So force yourself to work harder. One of the things I actually hear, um, probably the most common question I get um, at Picmonic, um, and I hear all the time, is, "Well, how many hours per day did you study?" Um, how many hours did such and such stu study to, to score a 250 or a 240 or a 230? Um, and, and that's not the indicator because everyone's different. Maybe my two hours is different than somebody else's two hours or four hours or six hours. You have to really be your own advocate here. And along with everything else, use your own assessments. So if you're taking an NBME every month, um, and that you know the next month, your NBME average score is not climbing at the right rate. Trim those scores out. You have to those statistics. Trend those scores out and see where that curve is going to end up going. Is it going in the right direction? If it's not going in the right direction, then you need to work harder, obviously. You need to work more hours per day and review more material because in the world of uh, you know medicine, you have to know everything, and that's definitely something that is just overwhelming and as far as 
it's just just overwhelming. You have to know everything, and it's definitely one of the um, the big differences between um, at working as a nurse and teaching lots of nurses versus teaching uh, you know working with lots of med students and uh, understanding the difficulties. Along, just like I said right here, um, with being staying organized, here's some things, some more important things, uh, and really important tidbits that really handy to know when you, you begin. Um, learn the residency timeline. And what do I really mean by that? Well, not just the timeline, but how it's going to pertain to you. So you pick that date in the beginning, right? And you know you need to pick that date. And what happens? I actually see so many students, they pick the date, but then um, they, after they pick the date, they're going to take step one. Well, they, didn't, they don't understand how their school goes to get in to start doing the rotations, or maybe there's a delay of several weeks or months. Make sure you know when, what year you're going to be applying for residency and build this into your timeline. Find out kind of what kind of cushion you have to give yourself more study time or if you're going to have to take, uh, take it, maybe take match to residency the next year. Why do I say that? We can go in, an, in, our, MP, in our MPs uh, website and get the timeline. It's another link we're going to send you um, at the end of this. But as well as not just that, but knowing which programs require ECFMG certification. And I, meant th I mentioned this in the beginning um, when I was talking about um, knowing what kind of programs you want to go to. Now, when you start first day of medical school, no, you are not thinking programs you want to go to. But let's give yourself an idea. Let's say um, I know I want to go to the state of – my home state of West Virginia. Let's say West Virginia, because it's a good. I already have the example there. So if I look up the programs in West Virginia, I also I know those minimum scores. But really importantly, I call those programs and I find out, or the, a lot of them have them listed on their website even. When an international student needs to have ECFMG certification. Now, what does that mean, ECFMG certification? You've probably heard of it, but maybe you don't know what that means. That means you've finished all of your rotations, and you've sent your, your materials into ECFMG, and they've processed it and stamped you, basically, to say, this person is ECFMG certified. That means you've passed step one, step two, um, and you've done all the requirements, and you've graduated from your medical school. A lot of times, that means including having a full and paid tuition. So all of these things are done. Then you send the application in, which could take up to 30 days, easily 30 days, especially if your school gets delayed, if you have, you know, some of the schools aren't as organized as others. So um, let's say you get done. When do you need to have the ECFMG, ECFMG certification for that residency program not to disregard your application? Now, I can tell you one of the places um, that, I'm, uh, that I know of in West Virginia, they make you require the ECFMG certification at the time of application. Well, application is September 15th is when application opens, and they can start downloading um, those applications soon after, just a few weeks after that application period opens for you to apply. That means that they download your application, and you don't have ECFMG certification right then, your application may go in the trash. It may. Most likely, because they, in the process of weeding people out, it most likely will go in the trash, electronic trash, as we'll call it. Excuse me. So that's required at time of application. That's the most. That's the earliest time uh, that you need to have everything done. It's September, October, and that's having that ECFMG certification in hand. If not, you really can't apply to those programs. It would be a waste of your money to apply to those programs because you're most likely uh, to get declined or rejected. Now, there's the next deadline, which is the most popular one, especially as programs are getting more and more and more competitive is the rank order de list deadline, which uh, this year was February 24th. So the rank order list deadline means to have your, you know, you, you applied, you interviewed, and let's put your rank order list in is February 24th in 2016. So um, I'm assuming it'll be very similar next year, of course. So rank order list deadline, that's the day you need to have everything in. When you submit on the end of that day, if you don't have ECFMG certification, you are no longer considered. You're removed from their rank order list. You may have been their first choice, but because you didn't have it done, you're removed from their from their um, from their list automatically. The computer does it. It's an algorithm. These are the kind of things you don't want to make those kind of those big mistakes. And when I say this, I, I talk about this stuff, and they say, "Well, I mean, I'm still early on. I don't want to think about it." But let's think about this. If you were taking an extra two months for your timeline to study for USMLE Step One. And that extra two months is going to cause you an extra year um, of time 
because you need to wait till the next residency year to get that one place that you really want to go or to even just give yourself more opportunity. Um, you may want to work harder um, during your time in your first 16 months and as you're studying for step two, push yourself harder to get a better score. And that's what I'm saying. Pick that date. All of this picks to that date. Find the dates you want to do and aim for those gate dates no matter what. Now, along with this, of course, be honest because if you MBMEs or those independent studies say you're not going to pass or you're not going to hit the score, then you're just not going to do it. Unfortunately, you didn't meet your goal. But at least you can create realistic goals and you see them and you can create this timeline. And med students are organized and that's what you need to force yourself to do. Create a plan and find the plan and tackle it no matter what. Now, of course, all residency programs require that you be ECFM certified at the start of your rotation, which is, of course, July 1st. That means you're interviewing. Um, you can interview with the programs. You can um, visit the programs, but you may not be ECFMG certified. This is what um, US, res U.S. med students do. All of the U.S. med students, they don't have to worry about this. I mean, this is the, one of the biggest key differences uh, because uh, where you have the rank order list deadline, ECFMG, and the time of application, ECFMG, because you're able to match to a, or apply to a lot more programs because they just you know, kind of draw the line um, for students. Because what a program doesn't want to do is have a student who may have, they won't get their ECFMG certification for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't pay their tuition, I don't know, and the school won't sign off on them, or they didn't have something done. And then they ranked them, and they matched in the program, and then they're not going to have an ECFMG certificate, which means they've not filled a spot. And if you don't uh, fill a spot in, re in the, the programs, uh, they have the potential to lose, um, you know, lose a lot of money. And that's really, really important. Uh, that's why they just weed out students. And you don't want to be the one weeded out for some kind of technicality like this. And of course, the exact same thing, all this is, of course, plan ahead. So you're planning ahead um, and a planning, of course, to get that type of score that you want to get, um, get in there as well. Um, so um, just to kind of um, review everything we talked about um, for our kind of our tidbits for success, we're going to send you the links, of course. Um, before we start taking some questions. So if you have a question, um, you can type it into the little question box there as we're reviewing um, so we can kind of have those questions as well um, and things we know uh, we can cover. But the big things are really kind of from the beginning, no matter where you're at, if you're in the very beginning and you're still maybe uh, you know studying your basic sciences or in your at the end, set yourself realistic timelines. Create a list and start researching programs and find their requirements. And then, of course, means reach out to them, look at their websites. A lot of this information is free and out there because they get asked it all the time. Find, search whatever hospital is, whatever location, residency, and whatever specialty. Find the information. Correlate what kind of score you need to get with things like the NRMP match statistic data, which we're going to send you the link to. You can go in there and see, oh, well, I'm going to do dermatology. Well, that's really, really competitive. And the, the type of score you need to get is very, very high. And of course, because of those, those programs that are more competitive or programs of a higher pass rate, they're also going to require, most likely require something like time of application, ECFMG score. Um, certification. And those are the kind of things that I hate to see students miss out on and end up waiting an entire year, which may or may not look, make your application look, you know, uh, may, may make it look worse or not as good as well. Along with that is planning. I mean, I say this all the time, plan what you're doing. But students don't do it. They continually um, don't make a plan. And that means, number one thing is setting a date in stone. Etch it in stone and work backwards from that date. And if you can't study 19 hours a day because you want to take step one in two weeks, then you just don't pick that date. You pick a date two months from now and you work backwards to cover X number of pages of first aid every day, X number of picmonics every day, X number of um, QBank questions every single day, and review each one. As you're reviewing them, use trusted resources, of course, to review that information. Something like up to date. Go to up to date, use trusted resource books, of course, the most recent ones. Uh, to make sure you cover that information. Um, at here at Picmonic, we reference um, all, a lot of major common books. So I see a lot of the changes that happen over the books over time. Just as an example, in the 2016 ver version of First Aid, they added um, types of incontinence into First Aid. Now I can tell you, we added types of incontinence at Picmonic because types of incontinence was a content area we identified based on user feedback that we were lacking. So don't you think you want to use the most up to date, the most version, the most act, you know, the most the current version of whatever resource you're using? I'm telling you, you are because things like that are most likely 
not the user feedback, but because they're appearing, those topics are things you need to know for your exam. And that's really, really important. There's a lot of kind of free points um, that a lot of students miss out on, as well as MBMEs. Doing those MBMEs and really understanding all of those topics in every MBME um, exam, those are the topics that you're likely to be tested on. So if you've got an MBME question and you just have no idea, um, I don't know what those statistics were. Statistics are a huge point part of your exam. You've got to know statistics, especially for step one and step two. It's definitely on there. And you're going to get a statistics question in every single block. Uh, we usually do a question and answer um, you know, session. So if you have any questions, you can um, type in those questions right now and um, kind of see um, what what we can offer. We and Basically, um, you're asking, not just myself, but you're asking um, what is our pool of knowledge from all of the hundreds of thousands of students that have you know, used Picmonic and wrote in and whatnot. So let's see what we have here. So it uh, looks like Juan writes in and he says, uh, what's the, what are our thoughts on USMLE RX QBank? Um, so USMLE RX QBank, uh, it's, a, it's a good QBank in the fact that um, they offer a lot of, um, in my opinion, and um, kind of the thought processes, they offer a lot of very straightforward type questions. Um, they're very, um, there's not as many second step questions. But what do I mean by that? Se two step questions or questions that are going to give you a scenario, and uh, we actually have a video on this, so kind of an example of how you need to understand, but they'll give you a scenario and they're going to talk about um, something like, um, hmm, let's see, mantle cell lymphoma. They're going to give you a scenario of mantle cell lymphoma, and they don't, you don't even, they don't even tell, they don't tell you it's mantle cell. A question like USMLE RX is going to really ask you, what is mantle cell lymphoma? They're going to ask you to pick it. Okay, great for you. But what we see with a lot, you know, QBanks like uh, USMLE World and, and the MBMEs, they're a two-step question. So you may have been able to identify as mantle cell lymphoma, but they're going to ask you about a feature of mantle cell lymphoma, maybe the translocation that you need to know, maybe um, some kind of drug that you need to give specifically for that particular disease and drug. And those are the kind of questions that, um, those two-step ones that I find a lot of students um, don't, they try to, they, especially international students, they deviate towards, um, they deviate towards having um, uh, those type of QBanks because they're, well, I think they're easier. And that's a great place to start. So once you start doing okay, switch to a, you know, QBank MBMEs and, um, you know, something like UWorld, see how you do. Uh, maybe even just buy a month and see how your percent correct um, differs. Um, not that US and Lyrics isn't bad, but it definitely, uh, from what we've seen in users writing in, it's not as challenging as the real exam, and that's definitely um, definitely what you you want to do is you want to have the you know an accurate challenge for yourself. Uh, so it looks like um, oh I'm not very good with this name, uh, so I, I sorry I can't pronounce it. But uh, so um, while in the Caribbean, what extra correct what extracurriculars would you suggest for a better resume? Um, so the biggest thing, the number one thing you can do um, for any type of extracurricular is a research project. Um, and I know everyone is like, ugh, research project. You can do a type of research project. This really, even if it's not a, you know, change the world type of research project, you're proving a couple things. One, you can get published. Two, you know how to set up a research project. Because all of these residency programs have to have they have to prove that they're researching things, they're learning things. And in, when you get to residency, maybe you're going to do a real research project with, you know, crazy type of things and thousands of participants. But even just the ability to prove you know how to set one up, you know how to do the format, all of those type of things are probably the best thing. Um, other than that, all of the other stuff, in my opinion, is all ancillary. It just kind of goes in and fits in. Um, there are other, you know, volunteering, those kind of stuff. Those are not really the things that... Uh, and I can't speak because I don't do residency um, inter you know, interviews. That's not my forte. But, um, um, but definitely um, kind of, you know, what's the word? Um, definitely things that they will take into account. But probably the most, most important thing would be doing some type of research to really help out. Um, let's see here. Oh, so <laughs> let's say you wrote it. So it looks, um, his name is pronounced Adib. Sorry about that. Um, and I'd like to hear recommendations on preparing for step one in terms of how to utilize available resources. Um, for example, I have Picmonic, First Aid, UWorld, but how do you devise an integration platform which utilizes them all? This is actually a really common question, um, and um, 
I'm assuming since you have all of these resources, you are maybe in the stages of planning to take step one. And um, so you're planning planning to take, take step one. Uh, but you need to, if you pick your date, let's say you pick your date. Now there's a, uh, there's a, there, if you, if you, if you're just not an organized person, um, there is a uh, program out there which we partner with called CramFighter. You can use CramFighter um, or um, uh, Osmosis, which is another company we partner with, to kind of, um, especially at CramFighter, go in and say, okay, I want this date, and you can, it'll show you, well, I want to learn first aid. So it'll break down the number of pages that you need to learn every day and break it out over the course of the time. Um, UWorld has about, what, 2,200, 2,300 questions. So if you're going to take an exam in 24 days, then you need to do about 100 questions every day and review those questions, whether you got them right or incorrect. Super important when you add in the time. 100 questions doesn't take two hours. It takes two hours to take them, but how long does it take for you to get the, you know, go through the answers and really review? And that's really, really important. Um, so you can kind of just basically set it, lay out a plan. Get a calendar. Um, and uh, we have a a USMLE Step 1 study plan out there as well, um, and excuse me, we can put that link in there for you, but it kind of breaks down the picmonics. Here's all the picmonics we have identified that are relevant for Step 1. Here's kind of a how many days you can do, um, you can take to, to do them all, and you can match that with first aid or match it with um, UWorld, so you're doing 100 UWorld questions a day or 50 UWorld questions a day. That's going to take you 48 days to get through all of UWorld. Um, if you're doing, you know, 25 picmonics a day, 30 picmonics a day, that's going to take you a couple of months to get through it all, and that's really important. The most important thing is to, to gauge yourself. If you're doing all the UWorld questions and you're getting a 30%, if you're getting a 50%, you're not in the ballpark to succeed. You need to get, be getting an excellent percent uh, to get, you know, to be able to, to, to really conquer the exam. So it looks like... Um, mm, let's see here. Have you heard of Becker's Review Company? Are they one of the top ones out there? Um, I, you know, I don't. I have some biased information on Becker's. I don't have anything bad to say about them. Um, so they, um, um, I, and I'm hoping I say this right. They actually used to work with uh, Golion um, as well back in the day, and Golion kind of broke off and does his own thing now. Why I don't know any of this, this particulars. Um, and um, kind of since um, the really the the more popular ones, as far as users that are right into Picmonic now. I mean, there's a possibility that they're biased in any way. Um, you know, they lead, it's not a name we hear very commonly. I've not used or reviewed their resource, so I can't comment directly. Uh, but I, you know, I've not seen um, uh, a big prominent push, and it's definitely not a name I hear very often at all, um, for sure. I hope that answered your question, Carla. So um, Layeth asks, um, what are your thoughts on Crush Step 1? Uh, the book by O'Connell and U.S. Assembly Secrets. I'm not familiar with Crush Step One unless it's I don't have the image of the actual book in front of me, but I can comment on U.S. Assembly Secrets. Um, U.S. Assembly Secrets is actually a book that I used um, as a second, you know, kind of the the extra resource to study. Um, it's definitely something that um, uh, you um, let's see how do you put it. So after you've kind of you you under, understand the content. Uh, you have a base understanding. Not something I would use in my core classes. But I'm taking a class and I've already had, um, uh, pa you know, pa pathophys on cardio. I'm going to review through that and it really kind of gives you a question scenario and it kind of poses it like a question and then it gives you an answer. It kind of starts conditioning your mind um, on how things, uh, how to really kind of think. And that's a good feature. They also have a step two, um, U.S. Assembly Secrets, which is really good because it, it not only does it fit in your pocket, but it's a really good resource. It doesn't, it doesn't have all of the information in there, so it's not a primary resource, but it's definitely something to use as a as a lookup. But they, um, it's kind of a newer book, and they've been really improving it. The last, the latest version on that book is the best. So if you don't have the latest version, make sure you get the newest version. Um, and I'm sorry I can't speak to Crush Step One. Um, you can always write to us afterwards. Maybe we do know it. We just don't have it. Uh, but um, I'm not familiar with it, depending on who has it. So it may not, may just not be that popular. Uh, Flora writes, uh, her weakness is in anatomy. What resource would you recommend for anatomy? Um, so there's a high-yield anatomy book. Uh, that's something, uh, high-yield is a high-yield, like high-yield neuroanatomy, high-yield um, anatomy series. It's really, really good. Um, something that if you've already had anatomy course, I don't recommend pick, taking out the netter's cards and trying to learn what you didn't learn for anatomy. 
Um, you can use um, things like um, pic we have we have some anatomy in Picmonic. Um, we don't cover everything. We got a lot of the basics that will really help you out. Uh, but um, for some of the advanced uh, anatomy, there's um, um, definitely using those type of books. And you can kind of flip through. And another great thing that I find is a good resource, um, you can actually download a lot of um, a kind of they're collaring books, basically, um, where you can go in and you can label and collar through everything in the anatomy sections. Um, it's definitely a good thing to kind of do. Really kind of test yourself. Because uh, anatomy is not something you can learn overnight. It's a long-term learning thing to really understand anatomy, um, how it goes, a lot of the body. And it's one of the things, if you don't know anatomy, can you get by without anatomy? Yeah. Are you going to be able to answer the questions as fast? No, because you really have to sit down and you're going to have to think about it. Uh, but uh, it's definitely something if you, you can't crush overnight, start every day and really push yourself to really understand it because there's a lot of memory recall. It's definitely one of the areas in Picmonic um, that students have been asking for more, and we're going to be creating a lot more anatomy uh, Picmonics to kind of help out. But for today, um, that's what I would recommend. Um, look for some of those. Uh, I can't remember which book it is. There's actually a collar, kind of, I hate to say collaring book because we're not going to collar as med students, but it's um, kind of an outline. You can go and you can collar and label everything. Um, it really helps a lot of students. A lot of students tell us that. And because um, what we know at Picmonic is you need to create associations for things. So if you can create associations by um, drawing it in or writing it into an image, I'm not artistic. I can't draw Picmonics. We have amazing artists here at Picmonic for that. But if I can look at an image and really label it and kind of collar it in, it really helps me solidify what the things are in my mind. Um, so uh, Carl asks, in, um, is it possible to leave research projects when we are doing clinicals? What would be a reasonable time to do that? Would we have a reasonable time to do that? Well, Carla, it really depends on your school. Um, so with the, when I say that, um, it depends on your school and the fact of, you know, do you have space in between your particular clinical rotations as you're doing them? Um, but more importantly, the harder thing, in my opinion, is you're not, as you do rotations, you're not in a classroom environment with 30 or 40 other students. You don't see 200 students every day. Um, and that's where a lot of the U.S. students, um, if you're doing, you know, a U.S. school, you're probably in all your students are in one location, and they'll do a weekly, you know, school thing um, every week, or maybe every two weeks, or every month, and you can kind of check in with all the other students and, and network. Um, with the international schools, that usually doesn't happen as often. You're only going to see one or two. So what I find is that's a lot of thought. A lot of students think that's going to happen, but it's actually really, really difficult to find a research project that you can join in on or start one, because you don't really have the resources to do it. Um, and if you're not an all-star student, um, if you, and if you, you know, uh, didn't understand, so you're also going to be learning things. So you're going to have to also study as well as try to, you know, run, figure out, find a research project. And a lot of students just they don't they end up kind of letting it fall behind. Um, definitely, while you're in the, you know, in the Caribbean or doing your first and second year is kind of the best time uh, to do it. So. Let's see what other questions we have here. Um, so, um, uh, looks like Iman says, um, I'm studying to take step one. What should I use for anatomy? Because many of my friends say they've seen a lot of anatomy lately on their step one. Okay. So, um, here is an interesting point, uh, and uh, I, I need to find some research that's out there. Maybe this would be a good research project. You know, students come out of exams. Now, first off, um, it's not, it's against every policy out there to come out of an exam and to regurgitate, share, recreate questions in any way in any of the exams. We also at Picmonic don't support that. However, um, what do you, people usually remember after an exam? They usually remember questions that they stumped. You're going to go into to step one and you're going to take 300, seven hours of questions. Which ones are going to stick in your mind? Well, you're likely, are you really going to get, are you going to remember those ones that you recalled right away and you got the right answer? Probably not. The ones that are going to stick in the forefront of your mind are probably the ones you got incorrect. Um, and that's what I, um, whenever I hear a student say that, um, oh, there's, a, there's so much anatomy on my exam. Well, there's anatomy on everyone's exam. But is your strength anatomy? Is what I always ask them. Are you really strong in anatomy? And they say, well, not really. Um, and then they're not really strong in anatomy. Now, what would I study if I were getting ready to take? Um, I, I would really definitely review, if, if you're not strong in anatomy, there's no quick learning anatomy at all. There's no way to memorize all of anatomy because it's just literally thousands of things you need to know. But definitely take a look at the high-yield anatomy. Make sure you know some neuroanatomy and the nerves and 
um, those types of things, um, as well as um, uh, you know just a lot of the general things. So you're at least not shocked by anything. Um, and I would you know really review those high yield anatomy uh, resources so you can kind of make sure you refresh your mind to understand. Uh, but if I was taking step one soon um, and I had all of the information to review, putting anatomy at the top would not be where I would do. I would always what I what I would do. I put the um, most high yield information, which is going to be you know pathology, physiology, and pharmacology. Putting those things at the top and making sure you know all those tidbits and how it all fits in are the important points. Um, I definitely wouldn't put anatomy at the top. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, maybe it's something you can you know plan for a long term of integrating lots of anatomy into your study. But not really something I would freak out about if it's not your strongest. Uh, you know, strongest point, but definitely make sure you review a lot of it. Um, and um, a lot of the review books, um, the Kaplan course, um, the actual Kaplan course covers a lot of anatomy in their course, um, and a lot of things that um, you know are very commonly tested um, as a resource. Definitely something that's in there as well. But also just review it as you go through. You're doing some neuro, and you need to review, um, you know, the the spinal tract, spinal thoracic tracts, and things like that. You know, or you're reviewing syringomyelia, and you need to review that type of stuff. Take a moment and stop and review it. Uh, you know, you you need to learn um, foot drop, and uh, you need to learn those type of things. Just take a moment, stop, and review it, because that's how you're also going to learn it for the long term as well. <clears throat> so it, um, it looks like um, we don't have any other questions that I can kind of answer easily. There's a couple other questions um, that really kind of need some more in-depth um, in-depth answers, and we'll reach out to those um, individually. But you can always write into us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, Picmonic's here for you. Um, you can always write into feedback at picmonic.com. Um, shoot us an email, and uh, if you have any questions, or maybe you have a specific thought, maybe you thought we didn't cover something, um, you think we, we should cover something better, um, you can always write to us with your comments and questions, but you can also just reach out to us as question, you know, if you have a question about something specific, especially if you're a subscriber to Picmonic, um, we'll definitely hear as an additional resource for you. 